Hi, just a quick note before the start of the podcast. Uh, we're talking about Le Corbusier, so there's pretty strongly sexual material throughout this episode. And um, if you don't want to listen to that or you're in the company of someone you'd rather shield from it, then maybe put headphones on. To have or not to have an erection, he who gets hard and stays with it is a man capable of strength, still a beast, deserving to live in the sun. I'm telling you this because it's true. Since I get my erections normally, I believe in life, desire it, and this spring I even have the impression that the desired act is fulfilled and that I'm entering the city. I'm through with what's back there. I was a child of La Chaux de Fonds, brought up far from life and in fear, in fear of God, they have effrontery to say. I'm entering the age of realization. Now I'm a man nearly six feet tall, named Janere, who's an architect, who has no diploma, who's capable of solving a problem and achieving his goal. Hiya! <laughs> You're listening to a podcast about buildings and cities. My name's Luke Jones. I'm George Kinchel. In later years, uh, Le Corbusier would present his move to Paris in 1917, the young man from the country coming to the corrupting city with big plans and implacable determination. In fact, there was no real big arrival. He'd been visiting on and off since he worked there in 1908 to 1910. So he moved in 1917 while the war was still going on, following his friend and collaborator Max Dubois, who had invited him to come and collaborate with him on the Société d'Application du Béton Armé, the Reinforced Concrete Society, or SABA, which did exactly what it sounds like. It was doing a little bit more in that it was explicitly trying to create the order of reinforced concrete architecture. All right, yes, the new style for the new yeah. Yeah. material. We can talk about that later. So, he w- yeah, he went to Paris. He moved in with Dubois on his fifth floor apartment for a little bit, and then he got his own place. Money was very tight. There's a nice description in the um, Fox Weber biography of how he didn't have any money to heat the place, so he painted an enormous scene of palm trees on one wall in order to feel warmer. Great at, great at like, painting murals and things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll be coming this back may, to this. This may come up a few times. So the letter which we heard, this um, explicit letter which we heard at the start of the programme, is one of many which are quoted at great length in the, in the biography. He was incredibly preoccupied by sex at this time. He had a real complex about it. He seemed to be getting some but he's also incredibly tortured and feels like he's not getting what he wants out of life. It's interesting. He's someone who like seems to get hornier and hornier and hornier through his 20s, peaking, I'd say, in his early 30s. But you, even later, he's still going, going hard. Oh, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's a late flourishing, I'd say. He hits, he hits like the extreme frenetic sexual tension... I don't. I don't know if the like mad sexual energy is relationship with actual sex. It's more that he has like he just has this sort of building up, and almost like no amount of sex could satisfy it, or the sex isn't quite right because really he wants to be having sex with the city. Yes. <laughs> Before he leaves, and this is a thing which in the in the book is referred to there are these strange ellipses in the book which maybe it's because i haven't got all the way through all the later parts maybe this is going to come back but it mentions that before he left la chaux de fonds he raised 20 to 30 thousand francs from local businessmen to invest in projects related to new building materials it's possible that some of that went into what became his major occupation from 1917 which was the founding of a breeze block factory in alfortville which is a, a sort of a, an industrial suburb, uh, well, like adjacent to a power plant, so using the, the slag from the power plant to make breeze blocks. He also nicked a load of money from his dad. <laughs> yeah, which it's not mentioned in the book. I don't I didn't know about this. Yeah, yeah, he seems to have nicked money from his dad. You know, as you do. It's another another reason they may have had to sell the house. Well, that's not very good form, is it? He seems but... a bit of a goer. <laughs> He's not someone to let, let, let shilly-shallying around get in the way of him. The cement factory, or the cement block factory, is an initiative which he can, he of I think it's an initiative of Max Dubois, which he becomes the kind of manager and sort of front man for. Which is which is he's good at being a front man, and actually he manages to sell lots of concrete 
cement blocks. But he's a terrible manager. Yeah. Absolutely terrible. Yeah, they do. Ha- they have some success. It, there is a market. The one, uh, there's one day when he sold a million bricks. It's a lot of bricks. But overall, the th- it never really becomes a going concern. Exactly. It doesn't. Yeah. yeah doesn't seem to. It's not. I mean, it was a great time to be in the building materials industry. Yeah, there was plenty to be getting on with. There's lots to be getting with. Um, but it just seems like he's very enthusiastic, and so. And he's well into new methods of construction, so... And he's, his mood is really, like, oscillating from kind of frenzied optimism to uh, dip, sort of depression. There's a real bipolarity. Here's, there's a, um, a diary entry which he sent to his friend William Ritter uh, after the foundation of the brick factory goes like this. Alfourville is begun. We're going to make bricks. The factory, the site actually, is attractive. The machines, powerful. The situation, magnificent. Enormous gasometers. The four overwhelming Est Lumière chimneys right next to our property. Coming home at nightfall, I saw the water shimmering and the great factory smoking, their luminous bays reflected in the river. There's this kind of reverie. Obviously, he loves industrial buildings. It's a thing which we're going to get into. I mean, he's, co- he's come to Paris to work on reinforced concrete. He thinks reinforced concrete and concrete products generally are his calling. And the, the sorts of projects which he's working on are in this field. He, he sells himself as a, an architect of industrial buildings. He's working out of his little studio. One of the big sort of consuming projects in this period is that he manages to get uh, shortlisted for a competition to build a massive new slaughterhouse complex in uh, Nevers. Uh, which is sort of uh, about 250 kilometres south of Paris, it w- which was like an enormous uh, sort of factory abattoir meant to be built on strictly Taylorist principles. If you want a little introduction to the principles of Taylorism, episode three. It's also, it's cropped up a few times. It's yeah, a big yeah, yeah. thing because we spend so much time, it seems, in the early 20th century yeah. when this was a big influence. So, but I mean, in effect, what it means is that it's this massive, um, uh, you know, pig killing production line. And it's very important it's refrigerated. It's all sort of moving ramps, escalators, intermodal transport, lorries, trains and um, canal barges. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a diagram. Of, God, you see like a lot of... They tend not to be abattoirs, but you do see a lot of student projects which are, which are based on... I've seen abattoirs in the, in the Bartlett, <laughs> anyway, yeah. It's quite not as popular as the fish processing plant, but... Yeah. Um, I've, I've seen this project represented most often as a plan. And the plan is like a diagram of process where the animals come in at one end and go on to various modes of uh, various forms of packaging and various modes of transportation away at the at the other end. It's a really pro- it's a really perfect sort of process building, you know, because you've got like several steps of process and each requires different conditions. It's a lovely, very simple brief to give someone, and then you've got a supporting sort of infrastructure, and everything is adhering to this nice route of, um, you know, the, the sort of way you can move animals around when they're still alive is different when you've um, killed them, is different to, you know, and then you hang them up on hooks on a rotating thing. What an interesting noise we have. Yeah, the house is vibrating. Yes, I live in a very shonky house. <laughs> if you can compare it with the one in the Chicago ones in the Jungle by Upton Sinclair, work on the uh, on the opposite on the gravity fed principle, where the animals get driven up an enormous ramp and are killed on the roof, and then, and then gradually kind of go down. And every time you chop something off, you like throw it some through some horrible filthy pipe in the floor, and it like <laughs> zooms down into the canning factory and like several stories below. Yeah, yeah, it's great. All the sweepings. And all the the fingers and things. Do you want to? I mean, he so he spent ages on this competition. They went through lots of stages. Yeah, multi stage competition. He had got first into a round of eight, and it, it was a competition with lots of um, charrettes, which are staged kind of intensive design workshops. So people would be doing the de- he'd be doing the design in a room with lots and lots of other architects. Um, and I think this is incredibly exciting for him because I think one of the factors in his psychology is this sense of inferiority that he hasn't done a proper architectural training. He doesn't have a diploma. He doesn't understand all sorts of things which would be part of the kind of uh, educational formation of... Particularly engineering, which is something that he would always have a slight sense of inferiority about. He gets through the first round and he gets into the round of two, which is the final round, but uh, he lose, they lose at the end. There are a few other industrial projects that also don't come off. There's a hydroelectric dam, 
which looks like a hydroelectric dam. It was quite bloody easy yes. to get work in those days, wasn't it? Yes, what, what we need is a jolly good war. <laughs> I mean, he's just a this, like, maniac. Do you he's think it's Swiss because maniac. all of the architects in the charrettes, presumably, are all the ones who, for one reason or another, are invalided out of the army? I mean, a lot of this, I think this <laughs> is a period of his life which is very surreal, and a lot of it would make amazing material for film. And I think that this, yeah, this would be great. You'd have all the people who have, like, the kind of mustard gas cough or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> like, and there's him with his glasses. Yeah, 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 yeah. One eye, one leg, you know, all this... If you, like, bang your ruler on the desk, half of them hit the deck. (laughs) Oh, war. PTSD. What japes? (laughs) Um, He also uh, actually managed to get a couple of projects. The only major built work, which I haven't seen published anywhere on the internet, is a water tower. Reinforced concrete water tower. I had no no idea about this, but it's a real thing. Yeah, and he seems to have concentrated most of the drawings about... It's got a, a reinforced concrete with a viewing tower. Not open to the public, but it seems to be quite nice inside. It's got nice bay windows. Yeah. Where is it? It's P-O-D-E-N-S-A-C. Well, for what it's worth, it's to the southeast of Bordeaux. Yeah, so he got a water tower (laughs) done anyway. um, I think it was... I mean, the only thing that's interesting to say about it is it's not all that far from Pessac, which is a suburb of Bordeaux where he would do... A famous housing scheme in his first big about, yeah, yeah, for a, for a sugar magnate. Uh, do you, are there any other projects? I mean, the, the, it's all very thin. The the Corbusier Le Grand book does it faithfully reproduces a lot of these, including he did like a garden terrace for someone, which yeah, is a concrete a concrete terrace with some steps. There's, a, there's, a, a, there's, a, there's a photo of. Uh, <laughs> there's not very much that you can really say about this one. God, there's a lot of photos of him on holiday. Getting into... We should put some of these silly photos up and some of the silly paintings. Yeah, no, we've got to scan them. We've got to scan them. Oh, God. So many, so many paintings. There we go. There's the terrace. I'll describe the terrace. Yeah. It's a small... It's a terrace. It's quite a large terrace for a house. It's got a stair. How many steps does it have? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten steps. And it ten has steps. a wall with a ball on the end. Two walls with balls on the end. <laughs> um, it's got one curved edge. It's got a banister on one side. It's presumably made of reinforced concrete. It's made of reinforced concrete. Okay. Well, it's probably of great um, heritage value now. He was meant to do the. In- he was meant to do an extension, a side extension for them as well, but the extension didn't come off. Oh my god. Oh yeah. It sounds familiar. Like, yeah, it sounds like my architectural career. But yes, yes, yes. Um, and there were lots more proposals. But, I mean, the, 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 it's worth saying the terrace actually only got built in 1920. Imagine the most boring job you possibly can, and then imagine that it doesn't get built. That's mm. the... <laughs> That's, yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, a lot, of the, a lot of our listeners work in the field of architecture. <laughs> They'll be very familiar with this. All right, well, let's get on to the big thing. So um, he'd remained f- on good terms and in touch with... Auguste Perret, whose firm he'd worked for between 1908 and 1910. We discussed them in the last episode. They're these pioneers of reinforced concrete. But one day in 1917, Perret put him in touch with a young man who he thought he'd get on with. Um, he, he did this sort of kind of intellectual matchmaking. And this was a guy called Amédée Ouzenfant, an artist and the son of an industrialist and factory owner. And the two of them hit it off pretty much straight away. And their collaboration would basically decide the direction of um, Charles-Édouard Jeanneret's future endeavours and literally be the mechanism of transforming him into Le Corbusier. He's, he's an example of these kind of bizarre characters which, with which this period of history seems to be replete. Um, his father was a wealthy industrialist who had died during the war and left unfinished a large factory for the production of munitions, which is near Toulouse. The young Amadei had to take over the management of the project on site. This is a, this is a very amusingly sketched in the biography, um, he, he, which he seems to have done re- reasonably competently. But um, what he what he liked to do after work on the site was over, after everyone else had cleared off to get away from the like intensely toxic materials, he would sit on his own in a shed on the site and just think about art. And specifically about his 
new theory of the art to come, which was called purism. It was a great age of that sort of thing. He seems to have been a, 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 a lunatic. <laughs> the pictures of him look um, don't look like that. They look, they look sort of um, like a slightly desiccated. You could you could imagine him as a sort of um, decadent, perverted, like a Howard Hughes character. He seems like that. He's had his, he has this crazy, intense lifestyle and these these fads. The two of them, the two of them, completely hit it off, and they were inseparable. They, it's this it's this instant bromance between the two of them. Yeah, to the degree that it's cited in um, his divorce. Yeah, he, his friends. He so he, uh, Enfant de, uh, divorced his wife around this time, and it was widely cited that his relationship with with Jeanne Ray had like taken him away from his wife in some unspecified way. But you know, read whatever subtext into that you like. I think. Yeah, well, they go on their they go on their cruise, yeah. <laughs> just like uh, just like walk. There's some there's lots of amusing photos. I don't know how much we can like rip out of this book without um, getting cease and desist, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll see about pushing that. Yeah, I think we should we should do as much as possible. <laughs> what the, the the life that they live together is this um, this life of kind of debauchery during wartime. So in during 1917, Paris is actually being bombarded. Max Dubois at this time apparently was getting like serious panic attacks from the shells falling and the explosions and all of this sort of thing. Yeah, it's not it's not like it's sort of it's sort of around the time of the second battle of the Marne. Um the Germans were like 40 kilometers from Paris at one point. And Janere doesn't seem to have been phased by it at all. Actually, he liked to sort of go out and watch the shells falling and seeing <laughs> things blowing up. Yeah, seeing, you know, every shell that falls is a potential site of redevelopment. Yes. <laughs> he wasn't short of money. There's this weird kind of confusion of different things. He loved to paint. His, he was mainly a painter. He'd made himself an experimental car, which yeah. was to his own design. He had got rid of all of his possessions, except for, like, a very specific set of things in this this kind of Marie Kondo-like and, way. And a massive amount of money. Oh, he, yeah. <laughs> he hadn't got rid of any of the money, but he, he, he had, like... A, you know, it was like decluttering before decluttering. The sort of, um, like, Silicon Valley billionaire decluttering. No, absolutely. He, somewhere there's a description of the things which he'd kept. Yeah, here. A sofa bed, six ch- uh, bentwood chairs, a table, an easel, some plates and casserole dishes, some books, and a bedside table. And a customised sports car. And a customised sports car. And, and a massive fast house and a fast wealth. fortune. <laughs> yeah. But the exercise, I think, is is kind of telling. He's um, he's trying to invent this sort of new aesthetic morality, stripping things back to their minimal. Yeah. Oh, Corbett this time also is really got into um, capitalism. He sees himself as a sort of Rockian businessman. Capitalists are the uh, are the great labourers of progress. He's got all sorts of dodgy businesses. He's trying to do system building. Uh, he's trying to get off the ground he's got his brick factory he wasn't all that careful with other people's money it was terrible so this he he before he went he had raised all of this money from various people taking it from his parents he seems to have gone on raising money from other people yeah what is all of that going into the brick factory where's it going i think it's it's going into his business interests his failed businesses later on it's all going to be lost yeah he goes bankrupt and then um is banned from becoming a director of companies <laughs> um, which has some effect later i mean it takes quite a bit to do that actually he, it's, it's it's like you've got to crash a few yeah 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 um not a good businessman don't lend don't lend him money serial serial failed entrepreneur what they did together was first of all both of them paint jeanere gets much more into his painting and they organize exhibitions which they do together where they both paint purist art. The painting is always coming and going for Jean Ray. I mean, it's always something that... It never goes away completely, goes through styles, but this is a point when, also, he's not getting as many buildings done, so, you know, he's getting more excited by it. They're living like, uh, they're living like footballers. It's, um, yeah. they, it, there's, it, there's a serious amount of kind of wartime privation going on, but the, he sort of wrote down these menus for dinners that they organised for themselves with sort of fresh fish, fresh oysters, some, some like, very ancient claret, uh, all, <laughs> all these different yeah. courses. Yeah. Everyone else is eating, like, um, you know... Turnips. This is the turnip. This is the turnip winter. Yeah, like a pair of old boots boiled <laughs> with some turnip leaves or something. <laughs> they would race around in Osenfon's, um custom-made sports car, which was built for two. It's very nice, romantic. And then, and then they would paint. So they were. Shall we? We can talk about um, about what the paintings are like. Also, before then, uh, Jeanne Ray had 
painted in um fairly kind of classical 19th century sort of watercolory style he'd then been influenced by Cezanne and there's some very Cezanne type landscapes not as not as good as Cezanne but that would be a big ask but you know in that sort of late impressionist style there's a little there's a few stabs at sort of sort of cubism which is the early stuff and then do you want to talk about purism it, to explain what the ideology of purism is you have to slightly say what cubism is because purism very consciously positions itself after cubism and that would be the name of a book which the two uh, would release in 1918 this is a time in paris from i guess like the uh, the, uh, the beginning of the 20th century a little bit after then through to the 1920s is a period when loads of people are creating styles putting out manifestos cubism is one of these styles we are in the era of dadaism just before the surrealist manifesto after various sort of you know, futurist, and I mean, I know that's initially, but the various other sort of movements that's all going on, and lots of people are writing manifestos and having styles of, and they're going to revolutionise. I mean, most people have probably seen a cubist painting, but it's the 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 kind of idea is that it's it's this fragmentation of perspective, isn't it? It's the object simultaneously understood from multiple different points of view, or in multiple times as well. Some of these people would have a very sort of notional understanding of like relativity, and it would be this notion of time and space. And movement also encaptures, I think, to a degree, speed. And so you end up with these very fragmentary, uh, kind of hectic compositions. But for the purists, cubism has become decorative. Although it started off with a kind of noble intent, this shattering of perspective, it's become a kind of a a sort of empty decorative effect. It's become bourgeois in its morals. It's become kind of empty, What's needed is a new style which, it doesn't restore classical perspective. The perspective which it moves to is the perspective of the machine, of technology. And so it's a form of representation which strips things back to these incredibly simple, flattened representations, which are often sort of layered in this very, very graphic way. So it's still working. One of the sort of weird things is that everyone still seems to be No one seems to question the assumption that you should be working with, like, still life of some objects on a table as the sort of er form of all art. But um, that's that seems to be most people weren't. That's not a that's not a that's not a general thing in the art world of the time. Yeah, well, that's certainly that's certainly there. I mean, the the works which they do are these views of objects or these views of kind of simple arrangements of forms, but they're visually reduced. The lines are clarified. The forms are concentrated. They talk about cleansing the plastic language of certain parasitical terms, as Mallarmé has done with the verbal language. I mean, I don't really understand the reference there, but I don't know Mallarmé. There's so many French writers at this time. I mean, that's the the thing. The other thing that the mainstream avant-garde, if there's such a thing, is doing at this time is Dadaism. It's the war. Like all our friends have died. Um, we're hungry, society is meaningless, we must, it's not meaningless, we must con- con- like confront the ridiculousness of the suffering and tragedy that we've all experienced and say that the, the bourgeois elite who have driven us into this war are, and their society is madness. And then these people are drawing sort of painting sort of slightly stuffy still lifes of guitars. and. Um... So what they talk about is bringing art into alignment with science and technology. They're trying to do that through a, a form of visual representation. I honestly don't really get it. Like, I can't really see how anyone could believe in this as an idea. But you sort of get what flavour they're trying to give to this form of representation. It's super stripped back. It's very, very simple. It's very graphic. It's very reduced. It's about essentials. It's And it's about clarity, sort of limpid clarity. And sometimes when things overlap, they kind of create these, these sort of almost um, transparency effects over each other. There's some rather obvious effects where they sort of will paint the elevation and the plan on top of it, like connect it. So it's sort of unperspectidal and a f- kind of flat projection. You know, like the bottles have circular tops which are drawn as circles. What are it, what's in them? Like guitars, bottles, pipes. Often they or they would work with a specific module so that the size of every canvas is the same. They like decided on a perfect canvas size and work with that. I don't. Know. I mean, I find some of them. I I don't mind them. I quite like. I quite like some of them. One of the important things that happens during this time is that he's developing 
this incredibly strong graphic two-dimensional aesthetic sense which is extremely important for the way in which he does his architecture and also the way in which he does his other other kind of outputs his books and things like that i mean another artist who's sort of semi-associated with this is fernand leger also a good painter quite nice i think better painter actually i quite like Ozon's paintings when they're next to Le Corbusier in the purest style. But I don't think either... I'm not even sure they're really B-list. I think they might be C-list. C-list. There's some really good art being produced in this period. Yeah, this isn't it. This isn't it. And also, <laughs> like, there's really good writing about art in this period. And there's really good ecstatic avant-garde writing about art in this period. And this isn't it. This, this, this is like the time of... Was it Peasant in Paris or um, there's the Surrealist Manifesto, automatic writing? Yeah, well, in Italy there's Futurism, which, in Italy is, there's, which is very, yeah. which I think share in its obsession with the machine. Although Futurism, I think, I think of that as something which really kicked off before the war. Yeah, it's uh, it's earlier. Oh, yeah. And then there's also like Vorticism in um, in England, which is the sort of like slightly inferior English version of yeah. Futurism. <laughs> I can never really... You, lots of people want to write about it because... Um, <laughs> because there's nothing so, going on in English art. Because England is so boring <laughs> at this time. Uh, well, but, I mean, there are, there are things going on in English art. They're just not very avant-garde. Uh, I mean, like, Van Nicholson's not very avant-garde. Or, I think there's some lovely works of art, but, but we don't have... You know, we have a bourgeois working class, a bourgeois middle class, and a bourgeois aristocracy, Luke. I mean, you know, where's the avant-garde going to come from? Abroad. Abroad. Menacingly. So that's, that's sort of the, the painting. But yeah. they took it very seriously. Ozonfon comes to the partnership with this existing manifesto, or sort of in, polemic at least, mm. which they develop into the manifesto of... Um, it's worth saying, I haven't read, I haven't read the le purest cubisme. manifesto. No, I, no. You don't have to. No, no, I don't. I don't feel. I don't feel guilty. It's quite easy to sum up. Um, <laughs> but their big project, which they do together, is that they start a magazine called L'Esprit Nouveau, the New Spirit, which I imagine Aux Enfants just like poured a load of money into. They're massive. The early issues are 150 pages long. They, after a while, they go down to only being 50 pages. Do you know what's actually in them? They wrote some of it themselves, but 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 I'm, I, the bit I don't know is what else is in it. Honestly, don't know very much about. I know a lot of contents written by them. I've read uh, an they article. They go for quite a bit of money. Yeah, I've An read. Edition's like sixty quid now, just one. I've got no idea what's in it apart from that. I mean, they commissioned some people to write articles about his buildings. The the publication ran from nineteen twenty to nineteen twenty five, and at the beginning of that period, he had built the work in. Show de form, but in Paris, or well, in France, he had built the patio and the water tower. Yeah. Uh, so there's not a lot, but by the end, by 1925, he was partly through the medium of the, partly through the propaganda of the magazine, a substantial figure in the French avant garde. Oh, something very important happens in in uh, edition one, which is. <laughs> He says he's going to be called Le Corbusier. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> he's not going to be Jeanneret anymore. Yeah. Not that wretched little bankrupt. So the... They decide together that they're going to write everything under pseudonyms. Which was fashionable at the time. And Aux Enfants' idea is, let's just write under our mother's maiden names. <laughs> uh, and Which is fine. <laughs> Curiously <not> quaint. <laughs> yes, isn't it? I didn't know that particular detail. Like, no one will figure that out. And um, <laughs> Aux Enfants' mother's maiden name is uh, Saunier, which is fine. But... Annoyingly, Jeanneret's mother's maiden name is Perret, which is the name of an existing architect of some renown who yep. he's personally worked for and who actually had his own ideas about the architecture of the future and, you know, the new, mater- the new age to come, the dawning age of new industrial materials. So he, there was, like, no way that he could allow his work to be sort of inadvertently mistaken for this other person. And also, it wouldn't be very weird, because they were sort of friends, so... Yeah, it's too strange. It doesn't make there's, there's some obvious so, problems. So he it. reaches back into the sort of mythic past of his family. They had a famous forebear called someone Le Corbezier, which who was... It's described as a famous Belgian in the biography, which I don't really know what that means in the context of Belgium not existing at that time, but I guess he was of that place. It may have existed... When was it? How how far back? Uh, well, like several generations before. Yeah. The 
the early days of he was Belgium. A, he was a yeah a man of that. Belgian, the only nation created after a, revo- a caused by a revolution due to the lack of fireworks and a romantic opera. <laughs> The Belgian Which I Revolution think is, of 1830, I think whatever it is. Yeah. It's a good... It's, it's um, a passionate people. A passionate moment, seldom repeated in the later history of Belgium. And I don't really... Like, I don't know any of the acts of, of Monsieur Le Corbusier, but he was, he was like a man of substance. I think he had, like, an Italian wife, you know. I think it's a cool name. He was a well, mover and a shaker. And he slightly changed it. He makes it sound a little bit like a corbeau, which is a, a crow. And he's, you can kind of see the features, right? He's a little bit crow-like. Yeah, which is good. I mean, the, the crow is a cool bird. That is a, it's a smart, scheming... It's, if you're going to name yourself after a, an animal... It's a good one. Is, a that good your, one. is that your animal? Well, I like jackdaws, which are the sort of hipster crow. I don't know. I don't know why I am. They're quite good because they have the white eye, so they have I think like I'm this real... parrot. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the really gaudy Plum- ones. Plumage, yeah. One of the really gaudy... Incredibly loud as well. <laughs> yeah. I found out some salient facts about Esprit Nouveau. It's yeah. quarterly. The 150-page edition costs 3 franc 75. Or had they decimalised their currency by this point? Yeah, 3 franc 75 on team. And the 70-page edition costs 6 francs. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> I see what's happening here. I recognise the point in the business plan that <laughs> where you sack everyone and you put the price up. Yeah, dramatically, yes. It's very proud that it's uh, being capitalised with 100,000 francs. That's what it says on the front of the um, first uh, edition. Well, no one saw that money again. But... Which is the sort of thing people um, companies did did say, like on their letterheads, their capitalisation. Which I suppose is quite Silicon Valley, isn't it? It's all about, you know, we've done a... We, we're, we're now worth 70 billion off the back of raising six pounds. Six pounds at 0.0001%. That's the one. Um, it seems like it's quite a cool magazine. The graphics is a huge number on the front. It says Esprit Nouveau. And did he do the graphics throughout? I mean, he's... Yeah. And in fact, he'd been developing a graphic style before. So there's the earlier books, which aren't really there. A story I've heard from somewhere which may not necessarily be um, uh, reliable is that he was... He developed the picture and um, sans serif font combination for a book that he was going to publish before the war called um, France or Germany, which is about how Germany's bad artistically uh, and then the war happens and this book is no longer necessary everyone knows that they're bad at pre cubism um is sort of getting there it's got the the uh, the some the typology is getting nearer so he's using typography the typography sorry i'm bad with words it's something you'll notice worse with names um so he's using you know you've got this might not seem very radical yeah we should describe we should describe this properly because i think actually that he is in a very limited way a real genius of graphic design. Yeah, he really comes good. up with one or two approaches during his life, but all of the big ones are massive hits. They're really, really good. At this point, the key is we're working with... And he wasn't the only person doing this, but he was a leader. Very big titles, yeah. really big headlines, lots of types of text on the page, you know, the subtexts of images, breaking up the text, and... A lot of white space, which people weren't using around images. So a well-framed image, a lot of white space. Um, he will move the the captions around to sort of. There's there's a famous in um, towards new architecture, which we'll talk about later. There's a famous thing where there's an aeroplane, and the kind of counterbalancing of the aeroplane in the frame. There's the the caption, and it's that sort of balance of title caption and text and they're very nice they're very good so there's a little spread from urbanism which we're going to talk about in a future episode but yeah you've got a really well chosen image of the pantheon with this sort of light flooding in at the top and then a, a like a really little uh, caption in a, a sort of nice um i don't know really how to describe it but it's a nice serif font it looks kind yeah. of you know it's got like an oldie oldie styley one and then there's um a big gap. Then there's a little three, which looks like a sort of a Bodoni three, or you know, one of that type of font. Yeah. And then there's a massive title in this incredibly graphic, completely sans serif, con- very condensed. Impact-y. Yeah. It's like condensed impact. Yeah. Impact. The much the much loved free Windows font impact. Um. And then the <laughs> then then the text is in something else. But he also does a really good thing with the way he presents sketches, where he the sketch appears. 
the background of the sketch kind of runs through with the white space of the page so that they just sort of yeah. float. It's really good. He's really, like he's got he's he he knows how to do like and they're they're very blown up and the pencil lines are like sort of massive and graphic. Or they might even be charcoal. Something worth noting is that the English reproductions of these books almost always do not have this layout. Which is something that was done from the twenties onwards. It's all been it's all screwed up in the English editions. Fortunately the uh French ones are. Is he? He's out of copyright. Yeah, fortunately, we've been obviously. No, he's not out of copyright. It's just, um, just that no one cares about like obscure French language publications from the nineteen. As, as men of letters, obviously, we read in the original French. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think we're getting towards the end. So we're not really talking about the content because, in fact, a lot of what start off as articles in L'Esprit Nouveau end up as standalone books. He publishes six books, which include material from the magazine. Those include some of the most famous um, books which he authored, uh, which we're going to talk about as standalone episodes and in I the future. Actually... Part of the reason with his fame and influence, particularly influence, is the books. And I think this is a general property of architects. If an architect wants to have huge influence, you need to do buildings, but you also need to have books. I think that's. I think part of the reason Palladio was so influential is because he published the four books on architecture and it went everywhere and uh, people wrote commentaries on it and it got into the textbooks which meant that even if people didn't travel they had collections of his drawings they had his theory yeah because otherwise they're in the middle of fucking nowhere aren't they and the same thing here people don't travel the globe but uh, uh, an architect in england who's avant-garde or in germany or russia or even possibly america although they have their own thing going on or even japan you know these works are published in what passed in that time globally as part of an avant-garde movement and they that, uh, uh, and they are immensely influential and they're immensely influential for a generation and that's that's i think a really key part of the spread and i think a big part of the influence comes from one book in particular and then it, there are other books you can see this right who are the the like if you think of the famous figures after him venturi rem coolhouse these are people who they do buildings, but the influence they have in the world is because of their publications. The magazine is propaganda for the new world and promotion for Le Corbusier. And he manages to run an almost quarterly magazine, self-promoting magazine, for five years. Presumably losing money hand over fist all the way through. And that's a, that is the key element, I think, in launching his career, yeah. which heretofore had been... Um, Undistinguished. Undistinguished. He was doing okay. I mean, I, lo- I, lo- I like the, yeah. wa- the water tower. I'd love to build a water tower. It's good. It's a nice <laughs> water tower as well. It's quite lovely. Yeah. Yeah, no, we would love this. this but he of... was far from being the most famous architect in the world, which he would be in a very short time. Yeah, he wasn't... When he started, he wasn't even... He was unknown. Yeah. You know. He was a provincial architect. The magazine run continues into the mid-1920s, but a moment where I think we can bring the episode to the close is his meeting and then subsequent partnership with his cousin Pierre Jeanneret, who was ten years younger than him, but had the great virtue of possessing a genuine architectural diploma. And not being a serial bankrupt. <laughs> the two met in 1920, and he writes all these letters talking about, well, like, what sort of sad sack he thought this um, cousin of his was. You what know, idiot. Yeah, he's like, oh, he's so apathetic. At his age, I was travelling all over the world and, you know, lusting after Albanian women or whatever. I, I don't know. I mean, I can literally quote the letter if you want. I'm stupefied by the apathy of this boy of 23. His nature is thoughtful enough, but so rarely individual. At 23, I had seen the Acropolis and built the villa Georges Favre, and I was already a tough customer. He is just beginning his studies and hasn't a clue what direction to give them. So that was in 1920. Within a couple of years, he has formed a partnership with Pierre, and Pierre had the great advantage. He had a diploma, he was steady, and he, I think, was... The, the kind of rock on which the future partnership was founded in the sense that he would keep the business on an even keel. He was like a steady head. And the two were essentially an equal partnership in business terms. They were said to be an equal partnership the whole way through. And I think in business terms they were. When it came to um, running the finances, 
Um, there's necessity for this because whenever Charles Edouard ran his own finances, he became a bankrupt. <laughs> yeah, no, when he'd briefly run his parents' finances, he'd run them immediately into the <laughs> ground. You know, 30 years of diligent saving yeah. gone. To be honest, like this is a model of uh, architectural practice which is quite common that you have a couple of partners and one of them is you have much Mr. More... Problems and Mr. Solutions. Yeah. So we leave, you know, and uh, I think we sort of want to cut it off here, but. Essentially, we we leave him as this thirty-year-old guy. He's he is Le Corbusier. He's well. He's becoming. He's I think become, we leave him on the. He's cusp. adopted the name. He's yeah. He's he's beginning to take on the role, and he is going to go into the architectural partnership, which will last for the rest of his life. And um, he's about to create the works which will make him the leading figure of the architectural avant-garde. So that's been fun. Yeah, good night. Thanks a lot for listening. Uh, yeah, yeah, good night. And um, be, it's good. We're recording two two episodes back to back, so it'll be slightly drunker at the next one, which yeah. is always something to look forward to in six weeks' time, or something. <laughs> Tell one friend that you found the best podcast you've ever heard. That's nice. It's a bit <laughs> ambitious. All right. Bye. 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 The same old taxi cabs that I had dodged for years. The chorus of their squeaky horns was music to my ears. The last time I saw Paris, her heart was warm and gay. No matter how they change her, I'll remember.